thank you for coming on this rainy day to um, to listen to me talk about um, things that are very close to us, but many people don't know about. So if we go ahead, I'll give you the contents of the talk. Um, it's the idea that what we've been told um, when we were at school might be wrong. And to talk about the Gask frontier itself and perhaps suggest that Agricola wasn't the guy who conquered Scotland because he was really a tax man. Look at Ptolemy's map and then a little bit about the locals and the watchtowers and the Roman roads and fun for all because only half of the watchtowers are identified and so we can go out and speculate where they are and a, a little bit about Inch Toothal at the end. So how about the story from school days? A quick two slides intro for that. Hands up and then next. The Romans arrived in the south in AD 43. Then Agricola invades Scotland in AD 80. There's a battle called Mons Graupius and then the Romans withdraw. But a lot of that doesn't quite make sense as you'll hear from me now. So the, um, we're told that the, if you, you've got the Hadrian's Wall that's constructed in 122 and then a consolidation back up to the Antonine Wall in 142, a few years after that. But there's other things going on that don't quite make sense. If you look at the next slide, there's this strange frontier um, that going going on above. If you look at the move on a bit, please. And then next one. So there's some kind of defence perimeter that's protecting Fife, um, it, and it's not um, a solid line. It's a line of watchtowers and forts. So that's what I'm going to talk about, the Gask frontier. So next one, please. It goes from Dune to Perth. And I'd suggest you go and visit it. And you find a couple of the watchtowers and then you can identify, if you look at the next chart, these are the ones that are identified. Uh, and particularly, I'd suggest go to look at Ardoch camp at Braco and go to Kames Castle, which is on the road from it. It's in the back of somebody's garden, but you're allowed access to it. Um, there are other ones that are worth looking at as well. But this is a feature, this is a, a series of um, archaeological features that exist up the road and most people don't know about it. Have a look at the straight Roman road next. So there's various stretches of this road and you can walk along there and you're walking literally along the same steps that the Romans did 2,000 years ago. Next one is a look at what early Roman Scotland, Caledonia looked like. There's 70 marching camps, there's a legionary fortress, there's auxiliary forts all over the place. Now, the, think about the Roman army, the legions were like civil engineers. They spent much more time building things, building roads, straight roads, building structures, forts, and then auxiliaries who were not citizens were given the task of occupying these forts. The evidence that suggests an earlier origin is because of this, these rebuilt structures and wooden posts, oak posts that have deteriorated. So this is clearly pointing to something that was earlier than Agricola's time. This is the um, northern part of Britannia and you can see the line of forts that go from Dune all the way up to Bertha, which is Perth, and then go beyond that to Stracathro and even northern from that. So we'll have another look at this. Next one.
So there you see the um, each of the red dots is a, a legionary fortress, and they all became cities apart from Institutho. We'll come back to Institutho at the end. And again, next, please. And there's, there's references to things going on before Agricola arrived on the scene. There's a clear understanding that Britain is an island, and there's the famous Ptolemy map. So if you look at that, next. This shows the um, their view of Northern Britannia. And if you look at it, it was almost they could not believe that people could live any further north. And so they turned Scotland on its side. Um, but you can see the, the, the Tay is there, it's mentioned. The Tyne is mentioned, the Forth is mentioned, the, the Clove is the Clyde. And there's a, a, a big forest in the middle. So that's the understanding that the Romans had at that time. And I think it shows a great knowledge. And they're writing down the names of places that our predecessors didn't write down because they didn't have a, a written culture. But we still have that written culture, in a sense, on the map. That's why we have Dumayat, the hill of the Maieti, and that's from the Romans. But one of the points that I wanted to make is this next slide. This is just a, a straight steal from Wikipedia, nothing too clever. But Agricola, who's given the credit of um, occupying Scotland, has a reputation as a taxman. The previous four uh, governors were all military, capturing trophies, a bold soldier subdued the Silures. And it's much more, it seemed to me much more likely, given that the archeology span suggests a longer period of occupation than would make sense from Agricola, that one of these others was the first to come north and to take over. So we'll look at the next one, please. The extent of the Roman occupation has fought all the way up towards Inverness and the Roman fleet sailed round the whole of Britannia and that's where they got the Ptolemy map but extensive occupation over a long period. So I'm going to show you now imagine Scotland on its side and we'll have a quick look at that. And then the Ptolemy again, just to see it. And then back to Scotland on its side again. So there's a, a long period, if you go to the next one, the locals, um, one of the archeologists I worked with made the point that over about 300 years, there was never a generation where um, the locals, somebody in their family remembered the last time the Romans were here. And they, so that it's not permanent occupation, but they're back and forward all the time. These are some reenactors. This is a site, an excavation of these roundhouses. And this is the kind of archaeological work that I was doing. And one of the things that's striking is, if you look at the next slide, the, the pollen that was taken from the first Roman trench cuts on the Gask frontier showed no large trees. So the next slide shows there was no large trees in central Scotland. The oak for the forts was imported probably from the Baltic into the Tay and the Forth and probably as prefabricated structures. So to make the forts and the watchtowers, the pieces were constructed beforehand and then brought into these rivers. There's evidence from pollen about farming productivity increasing dramatically 
particularly with these cows. These are antique cows. I've now forgotten the name of them, but if you can, you can look at them, and if, I'm sure someone will know uh, who they are. And they had, the Romans, the next slide, was a huge increase in wheat production and beef and leather. So where we use plastic, the Romans used leather. And they had a particular dish that was made out of beef. And they would make a small bun of wheat bread and they would fry this little meat patty and serve it between the two pieces of bread. It was like a McDonald's before McDonald's existed. And it could be that this whole structure was about planning for expeditions to the north. So as in this next slide, you can see how the, the different tribes were there and these forts were lining up potentially to move north. But back to Agricola. I don't think between 80 and 83 is enough time for all the, all the archaeology to, to make sense. So I think there has to have been Roman occupation from the 60s or 70s. And that might mean there was never even a Mons Graupius battle. Now, Murray and I have talked about this and he argues that um, Tacitus could never have got away with it um, if there hadn't been a battle because the soldiers would have said, hang on a minute, but moving on down. This is to encourage you to go and look. Now, this is 23 miles long. It's 100 miles north of Hadrian's Wall. It's a mixture of watchtowers every thousand yards or so and roads. Stirling is the key crossing point but the main forts are at Doon, under the primary school, at Ardoch in Braco, at Stragith near the farm, and at Bertha in Perth. The one that's easiest to see is at Ardoch. So I'll have a look at the map just to see. And there's an illustration of what the fort at Braco looked like next. The Roman forts were built in a playing card shape, very distinctive rounded corners. The different uh, ditches that you see reflect different occupations so they would come to the same place and build another fort and it didn't, they wouldn't rebuild um, and they would come again and build another fort so that's why you've got a series of different ditches. And those blocks that you can see are the blocks of each century of 80 soldiers um, with the centurion in the office block at the end. The fort at Braco was a cavalry, a mixed infantry cavalry fort. In fact, all of the auxiliary forts in Scotland appear to be mixed cavalry and infantry forts. The next is a, a, a couple of aerial photographs and just bang through quickly of the fort at Braco. You should definitely go and visit if you haven't been there. And the next one shows up in the in the snow. The building in the middle is a medieval chapel. So it was a quite often uh, churches and other structures were built on top of Roman features. And the next one describes the frontier itself. Um, it used to be felt that the Danube was the first frontier the Romans built, but it appears that actually the earliest one was just north of us. It was established 50 years before Hadrian's Wall, and it was tufted forts, timber built watchtowers, and they're every thousand yards. And big oak posts holding them up. So imagine this lot, all of this stuff has to be brought in because there's no local uh, trees of any consequence. And a single entrance facing the road. So if you have a look, the next slide shows the road along the Gask Ridge. 
it's an old black and white, but it does the job very well. So that's a, a Roman road that you can drive on. At the other end, you can um, watch uh, and go along it. Next slide shows the types of watchtowers that were almost certainly in use. Uh, someone speculated that they wouldn't have roofs, but I can't imagine the Romans um, building roofed towers on the Danube, but not having roofs in Scotland. So I think they would have roofs. And then showing the use of fire as a way of signalling. This is an interesting one. The towns along the Danube all have replica towers because they're making a big thing out of it. Whereas here, we don't have anything. There's very few bits of interpretation um, in between Perth and, and, and doing it all. A couple of signboards is all there is. So have a look, the Romans again back to, is it Agricola? I think he's a civil servant, he's not a soldier. The evidence of rebu rebuilding of the Oak Towers suggested that there's repeated occupation. Um, there's even different designs next to each other. Along the road from Cairns Castle, you'll see two um, different designs just sitting next to each other. And then a couple of aerial views next of um, the watchtowers themselves. And then the next one. So you can find these online. That's the Cairns Castle at the back of the garden and it's certainly worth a, a visit and the next is a model that shows the sort of structure that would be there you can see these are auxiliary soldiers because of the shape of the shields so the, the the legion soldiers built the structure and then left it to the non-citizens to get on with it the next slide shows a couple of um, sections from the archaeology and you can see that there's a prime in the top one there's a primary post pit and then a secondary post hole so you've got two different post holes being dug one after the other in each of these and that's suggesting that an oak structure deteriorated to such an extent that it had to be rebuilt next is a section just to show that i really was doing archaeology in the rain and um it does nothing else except show that I got wet that day. Next one, please. So the, I think there's dated finds that come earlier. And so what I'm doing is questioning the Agricola start point. And just for a bit of fun, we have uh, a hero riding through the legions on the next slide. Um, most Roman officers didn't ride about, they walked about. But I think Agricola might be considered a consolidator. Um, the campaigns in the north were really led by his predecessors. He proclaimed his presence with the legions and established an, a line of advance possibly to, to, to move forward, as you can see from the next slide. And the local tribes were dealt with by the early 70s. And on the topic of slavery, remember uh, hunting dogs, um, minerals and slaves were what the Romans were about when they came north. They were taking people into slavery. The, I think the next one is the same story. I think he's exaggerating his father-in-law's achievements um, I don't think the dates quite work. I'd like to turn to Inch Toothall now. Inch Toothall is the only Legion fortress that's not built over. And it was the fortress on the wing. And it was occupied by the 20th Legion, Valeria Victrix. There were seven miles of wooden walls that all had to come in prefabricated by the River Tay, and they had glass windows. And the next slide shows um, 
uh, Willis Croft, uh, as and he's soaking wet as well because of the weather. <laughs> it was shocking that season. Um, and he said to me at one stage, this used to be the most densely populated site in Scotland. And if you look at the, the fort in the next picture, you'll see why. So it's a legion, uh, 53 acres. And um, again, each one of those blocks is a century. So it's a cohort per uh, block. Um, so the century and then each one of them, so you can count the number of soldiers who are there. But one of the things that came up from the archaeology was the existence of a huge amount of structures outside the formal shape. So in truth, though, the next slide shows that they're, they're withdrawn. Um, there's a fighting on the Rhine and in about 87, the fort was slighted and the 20th Legion's pulled back. And the, the nail story is fascinating. If you look at the next one, there's seven tons of nails that were found. And the archeology, span so they'd hidden them because iron was uh, an important military source, resource. They dug them into the ground and they were found in the fifties. And I can't remember the name of the chap who um, found them, but he gave large numbers to every museum he could contact. And then he still had tons left. So it finished up in Motherwell at the Ironworks. So that's the end of the story. A little quick look at the, the diagram showing where Inch Toothel is. And that's Agricola and the First Frontier. And thanks very much. Go on, pause. Thank you, Jim. That was fantastic. I really enjoyed that. Very well illustrated. Very well. Uh, not a very good knowledge of that whole subject. So, <coughs> if I can, uh, I'll ask everybody to uh, unmute if you can and uh, give them a round of applause, please. Thank you very much. <laughs> Great, so that takes us uh, up from that section. Um, you all, uh, and, and yep, so what we'll do now is move on to the Q&A session. Uh, I will stop sharing the screen. So if you do have any questions or any points that you'd like to raise, uh, you can either type them in the chat, raise your hand and unmute yourself. And uh, feel free to ask away. Uh, yeah, uh, Aya Rees. What, what do you mean by slighted, when, when the place was slighted? What does that mean? Oh, it's when a, a fort is, or any castle structure is destroyed. It's flattened out. So the technical term is slighted. Right, thank you. Sorry, I had myself muted there. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, thanks for your question, Isa. Uh, were there, I'm going to say this wrong, but were there cows at Arut, Arox? They're not totally wrong. It might be earlier. Are they not? Are they not more prehistoric than than Roman? But um, I can't remember that. that I, I remember sourcing that image for for a very early cow species, but I thought Arox were like the size of horses, they're huge things. It can seem quite reminiscent of like what the Egyptian ones would have, like very early domesticated cattle. Um, but yeah, well, that was quite interesting. I enjoyed that with the cows. Um, given the nails were hidden, uh, do you think they were intended um, intended to be returned? Do you think they were um, hidden to be reused again? I doubt it. I think that it showed that they were leaving without much notice. Mm -hmm. So they probably hadn't finished the construction and the, because of the stuff on the, the eastern part of the empire, they, they were just called out very quickly and told to get south. 
and because iron was such a valuable commodity, they, 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 they weren't able to transport it back and they just buried it in the ground to hide it from the locals. I, I, I like the idea that he couldn't give away, he couldn't give away seven tons of nails. <laughs> the only thing he could think of doing was sending it to the steelworks eventually. I've got in my head making more like the Game of Thrones, how it's all about swords, making it with iron nails, yeah, something like that. Yeah. Um, but no, no, it's, it's nice that they've been distributed among so many museums. Um, in the absence of oak pollen, uh, actual evidence of, is the absence, I'm sorry, let me start again. Is the absence of oak pollen actual evidence of the absence of, sorry, that's a tongue twister for me. Uh, so. No, it's a, it's a fair point that it was one of these things that came as such a surprise when the work was done. The, the people, the only pollen from 2000 years ago that was around was willows and small bushes and things like that. Uh, our forebears had cut down all of the trees uh, for agriculture. And if you think about um, even the 1700s, the 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 trees the, the the wooden structure that held up your roof was valuable and people would take it with them when they moved to another firm tune uh, so just not enough solid oak mm. around this area uh, it's, it's, it's been quite a responsible managed uh, i remember hearing something that the only on the bit of forest in the whole of europe that's never been cut is in poland uh, there's a few hectares of it, um, and it's <laughs> the only piece of woodland that's never been harvested before. So, uh, that's something that's in the whole of Europe. There, um, we've got Catherine asking, "How does Carpo um, fit into the Sierra?" Am I saying that right, Carpo? Carpel? Oh, the the um, there's a again there's a piece of excavation there. If you look at the the Roman Gask website. It's not been live for a little while. I don't know quite why Williscroft and his wife, Birgitta, haven't been active, but the, the report is on there and there's a description and diagrams of how it fits in. But I mean, the thing for me is the idea that they had created a road network up past Aberdeen to Inverness. And it's, I can't remember exactly, but it's like, you could get a letter from Aberdeen to Arabia in three weeks or something ridiculous. <laughs> in Roman times, it was hardly repeated until recently. <laughs> but, uh, are there any other questions around the room? Uh, if, if you've got any, any to ask your question. I, 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 I did ask you at the start, but not everybody would have been here at the start, uh, Jim. So uh, what's, uh, how did this uh, lecture come about? What were, how did this, what's your background in it? I uh, volunteered, I volunteered to uh, work with the Roman Gas Project maybe 15 years ago and did it for about 10 years. Um, a lot of geophysics and some excavation and it's quite striking how uh, effective that line of watchtowers would have been. It's not a defensive line as much as something to do with taxation. If it was a defensive line, it would be either more dense or less dense. But having a watchtower every thousand yards uh, with the soldiers supplied from these cohort forts, the one at Ardoch, at Dune, at Stragith and at Perth, um, maybe 500 soldiers in each. And th they are providing the people in the watchtower and it's about control, it's about taxation. And so they're, they're managing this, the flow of people north and south and probably establishing Fife as a, an agricultural resource because of this demand for wheat and uh, beef and leather. Um, but, uh, and it's interesting that the pollen changes as part of that. So it's clear from the pollen counts that the agriculture locally changed and you could see more wheat 
and, and then more grazing that points to more cattle. Well, that would have been, uh, if I was a Roman soldier, that would have been basically my diet then, is just beef and wheat. Uh, like um, things, uh, what, what would be a typical diet? Or what's because important food? Or yeah, I think, and also they had a, di a disgusting fish sauce as well. They had, so they, they, they got the fish to rot and then created a sauce out of it. So, uh, and that was very popular. But also, they're bringing wine, and part of the 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 tech, part of the the culture was to subvert the local aristocrats by bringing them into Roman culture with wine and uh, olive oil and posh food, mm -hmm. and it worked better down south. And the further north they came, the the less. Um, towns that they were able to find and they, they couldn't quite negotiate. They, they thought they'd negotiate with the, the local chief until they went up the road another glen and found another person claiming to be the local chief. So it was all much harder for them. And eventually I think they just decided we just use this place for slaves and wild dogs. It's uh, uh, definitely something uh... It must have been such a hard area of control compared to certain how expansive the empire was, and then to have that stumbling block uh, just around here. Uh. Although they, they did invent a, a special garment that was named after Hibernia, it was like a hoodie, a duffel coat, the first duffel coat in the world they invented, and um. The letters home, even from Vindolanda, saying, please send me more socks. This is so cold, it's horrible. Oh, yeah, well, this is it. It's, uh, it's, there's so many other things that come in with it, uh, the supply lines and things that you need to, to support the kind of groups that they would have had here. Uh, Jill's asking, in terms of dating the earliest occupation, uh, what is the most interesting archaeological, archaeological find? I, I, that's a good one. It's more um, indirect, I think. The fact that oak structures are rebuilt is what's telling for me. I mean, it takes a long time for um, four oak posts holding up a watchtower to deteriorate. And to see that being replaced says this has gone on longer than the school books say. So there's more going on. And it's more complicated than, than we understand. So I don't, I mean, there are early coins, there are early finds, um, but you can't point to that. What I think is the most interesting is the indirect stuff about this kind of rebuilding because, and even the reoccupation, the, the, the place along the road from Kames Castle where there are two um, two watchtower sites next to each other with different designs. That's there's, there's more going on than just a forty-year occupation or something. I think Willis Cross Point for three hundred years there was never a time when somebody in your family didn't remember that they were. Oh, it's them again. Oh, crikey. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's quite interesting about the two different styles of structures. Um, yeah, is there um, evidence of sort of improvement along it? Are, are these towers very, can you say that design is of a certain era or a certain commander, or are these very much unique? I think the speculation is that one, one is very early and the other one is from the time of the Antonine Wall when... Um, forts were recreated north of the Antonine Wall, which people don't, re don't understand really. Um, in the Second World War, one of them had an anti-aircraft gun put on top of it. <laughs> it's kind of weird, but... Yeah. Well, if it's still standing and it will hold that, it's uh, done a good job. Uh, I mean, that was really interesting about how you were saying they've done a lot of these reconstruction work ones, um, uh, these uh, interpretation ones, but there's apparently none up here. I, I definitely would love to see a few of them rebuilt. Yeah. Hey. I, it, it always seemed to me 
we're, we're missing a, a huge opportunity. There's this uh, fantastic story to be told about this uh, first frontier in the Roman Empire, and there's nothing, very little. There's a few cleared clearings in the forests and up from Dune, but hardly anything else. I was okay. promoting trying to get one built the other uh, a couple of years ago, but it came to nothing. Well, what was the, the main sort of hurdle? Was it um, finance? Was it people's unwillingness to do it? What, what, what kind of...? Um, uh, it was part of a, a housing development byproduct, mm -hmm. and I, I came to finance, I guess. But I just thought that there's a, a couple of great places you could put one, even next to the, the A9 as it's going north. The, the, there's a place that's close... Mm -hmm. Even green loaning, as you, as you go up past green loaning, you know, when you're heading north, where the um, the pylon sits is very near to one of the watchtowers. And what I, I like is to take people to show them a watchtower and then let them go into a wood where I know there's one and let them try and search it and they find it. And it's so exciting for them but then half of them are not found. So mm. you can speculate, well, that's probably where there would have been one because it's one every Roman mile, every thousand yards or so. Um, but you, they're not all mapped. And so it's, it's quite amusing just to go along and think, where would there be one around here? Uh, I think that's it's fun uh, for all the family, as I said in that. Yeah, uh, definitely. It's, uh, as far as that mystery goes, there are a lot of things, all the world's all explored, every bit is mapped out, but there's so much there that's been forgotten, lost, that can be rediscovered, and it just takes uh, the people interested in it, the next generation things to get involved. i uh, got a point here from Peter. Uh, so few of the forts are accessible, so little is done to show the line of the roaming task. What could or should be done uh, to make uh, more of this... Uh, to make more of this like. Uh, the Roman gas project reached relatively few and what is needed to be done is a far more joined up publicity. In England, have anyone knows that the Romans were ever here? Um, so yeah, kind of on a bit what we're saying there, Jim? Yeah, I, I think I, I couldn't agree more that it's, it's like an unknown uh, time period and Woolwich Cross Point that there's 300 years when Nobody, there was always someone could remember the last time they were here. Um, and I think uh, reconstruction as they have, the, imagine a little, little town along the Danube where they claimed that was the first frontier. And they've all got their own reconstructed tower. Mm. And it's a little museum piece and they've got bits and pieces from Roman times or um, replicas. And we could, we could have one of those for not a lot of money. Um, and it could be next to the A9 as it's heading north and um, it would be like a welcome to um, Roman, Roman Scotland because pe people see the Antonine Wall and that's it mm -hmm. but they, they, they were all over the blooming place they were up here and round to Aberdeen and Inverness and all the rest so. I mean, guess look at the, the North Coast 500 what wonders that's done for the tourism getting people up there if you had this Point and it's yeah. all the local businesses and hotels and things along the way. Uh, Meg says, um, uh, we'll just um, go through a couple of these points. Meg's asking, would you like to see the watchtowers rebuilt? Uh, George and June there are asking, uh, are making the point there are still two hairs of ancient breed of white cattle in Hamilton, in Hamilton it's Lanarkshire, and at Killingham, it's the Northumberland. Um, Jim's is saying, uh, we do seem to be obsessed with the Roman army, the military campaigns, and don't look at the commercial and economic exploitation. I was interested to note that you think that the gas frontier is linked to taxation. One argument is that Hadrian's Wall was used to monitor customs, revenue, or show uh, the might of the Roman as much as it is, uh, if not more than defence. Um, so, yeah, and we've got Meg saying, I can't see, it seems That's to remember that the current, current archaeology uh, had, oh, I think there's a missing. And then uh, Catherine's also said, the heritage tour 
tourism opportunity we have here, um, the Roman Trail, the self-guided walks, interpretation, education, Roman gas, festivals, um, a reconstruction walk would be great. Um, so, yeah, I think uh, there's a lot of people that are quite up for this, uh, for tourism. And yeah, I, I, on the economic exploitation point, I think I, I made the observation a couple of times that the, what the Romans were about was taking slaves um, from the local population and they were able to convert agriculture locally, as I've said, with, you could see from the pollen and, and the ancient white cows, whose name I'd forgotten, thank you for that. Um, but the, this is this is not a nice culture. This is a horrible culture. If you if anybody wants to look at Tom Holland's Dominion book, um, a Roman culture was horrible. It, it was I mean the treatment of my treatment of anybody who was not a male aristocrat was appalling, and um, so it's not admirable. It's just a fact, and it's interesting that we have it all over the place and we don't acknowledge it whereas in continental Europe and along Hadrian's Wall it's a it's a big thing mm -hmm. um, so it's there's a tourist opportunity kicking around even although their society was pretty horrible and they were all about slaves and capturing red-headed people from here a bit like you Ross you know <laughs> yeah, <laughs> got a cupboard full of redheads. <laughs> no, no, definitely not. Uh, but yeah, no, it's um, no, it's a it's fascinating thing. Uh, as much as it was the, the, the control of the resources of the people, you've got the uh, aspect of taxation control, but that installing of the way of life and the class system. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, a lot of mixed things in there. Uh, ties really nicely in next week's lecture all with slavery and uh, Sterling's link in particular with it. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's a, a different, uh, certainly a different time uh, place where we to have indentureship and slavery. Um, ah, here's the book there. And that's uh, Wollescroft. That, that's the that's the Wollescroft and Brigitte Hoffman's book. She's she's really clever. She's a lovely girl. Um, she's done analysis of each of the Roman uh, fortresses across Europe and North Africa, looking at the structures of how the civilians were inter integrated into it. Um, so the, the, the different level, who, where did the army control extend? When did the civilian control start? And things like that. But yeah, good, interesting folk. Absolutely. Right, well, I think uh, we'll leave it there for this week. Uh, so just um, like again to say thank you very much, Jim, uh, for a fantastic talk. Uh, very well illustrated. I'm sure absolutely everybody enjoyed it. Next week, as I was mentioned, we've got Marie Cook talking about uh, sterling slavery links. Uh, we also have Isabel Smith, who uh, at some point in the future is going to do a talk for us on the engine shed. Um, but I'd like to take this opportunity, if anybody out there has a talk that they'd like to deliver, um, just send me an email, get in touch. Uh, it's events at Bannockburn House. Um, you can find it on the website. or um, Yeah, uh, so uh, that. But I will ask everybody again to unmute themselves and give Jim uh, another round of applause for a great talk and we will see you back next week. All the best guys, have a great Wednesday.